Good morning, everybody. Good morning. All right, we'll give it just a minute or two for people to sign on and then we'll get rolling. I see you flexing on us, Dr. Myers. I see you flexing on us. Look at you. What am I, what am I flexing? What? The, the jury, the little hair in the bow, and or oh, bun, right. however you say it. My Ruth Bader Ginsburg descent collar. <laughs> and the hair is also just keep it on my way. <laughs> Let's be honest. <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> no problem. Hi, right, I'm just taking attendance real quick. While we're waiting for everybody to sign on, looks like people are doing pretty well with this. All right. Couple quick reminders of what's coming up. Actually, let me open your syllabus real quick and we can, uh, I'll screen share it just so we can all be on the same page. I know it's harder when you don't necessarily have it printed out in front of you. So uh, let me pull it over here and then we can look at the schedule together. Alrighty, so uh, today we're going to start talking about research after we do the last couple slides of our um, uh, models. There we go. <laughs> Can't think of the name. Our models uh, lecture, um, and then we'll talk about research and assessment. Finish talking about assessment, treatment, and diagnosis a week from today, and then your first exam is next Thursday. So that is going to be on Blackboard. Um, it'll be multiple choice, fill in the blank, and some very short essays. Um, so I believe, let me, um, I'm gonna leave this up for you for a second. I'm gonna check something on the side here. I think I already have the review sheets on Blackboard but I don't want to lie to you. So I'm gonna double check that. Uh, the other things coming up, uh, two weeks from today, your individual meetings with me are due. I think I've maybe seen about a quarter of y'all so far. Um, so make sure that you're scheduling that. Even if you already know me, remember you get 10 points just for meeting with me. So make sure you get yourself those 10 points. Uh, and then two weeks from Thursday, your topics for the group project are due. So be looking through your book, uh, be looking at the list of things I suggested in the syllabus. Let me actually scroll up so you can see those links. So if you go here, there's a list of all the disorders in the DSM. Remember you're doing one that isn't covered in class. Um, but there are a lot of them we don't get to. So anything in childhood, we unfortunately no longer get to the disorders of aging I used to. And what I found is that uh, everything just expands and takes more time, uh, which in some ways is great, but also means there are things we don't get to cover. We don't cover any of the sleep disorders or any of the impulse control disorders, which include things like uh, kleptomania, uh, impulsive gambling, things all around those lines. So there's a lot of good options. Um, so I don't have the review sheets up. So I'm gonna make myself a little note to post those after class today. Um, and then you'll have it. It's basically uh, just sort of a guide for what to focus on as you study. Um, I typically pass these out in class, which is why they're not on Blackboard, but obviously can't do that this year. Uh, so I will make sure I do that after we're done. Um, so that is a week from Thursday again. So not this Thursday, not in two days, uh, but the week after that. Um, so be working on these video assignments on Launchpad. Um, again, if you're having any trouble getting a Launchpad access, any technical issues, use the tech support info in the syllabus. They're great. They've helped me with stuff. 
uh, and been pretty quick about it actually. And um, the other thing is if you are cash strapped um, and you can clear aside some time, if you sign up, you can do a 14 day trial. So if you have some time, you can just do all the assignments for the whole semester. And I'm not gonna judge you on that. And that's cool. I know of at least one person in class who's planning to do that. Um, so that's another option as well. Uh, but again, remember that this is the cheapest way to get the book if you haven't gotten the book yet. I believe it's $99 for Launchpad Access and the ebook. So a uh, pretty good deal considering all textbooks are like $1,000 now. I think this one's like 300, but still, right? It's ridiculous. So, um, so again, just be aware of exam a week from Thursday. And then the next week after that, your individual meetings with me are due and then your topics for the group project are due. All righty. Any questions about the syllabus or any of the assignments coming up? Okay, well, I am going to share our PowerPoint then. Let me make sure I open the correct one first since we are gonna be working off of two different ones today. So again, if you're following along, if you've printed out the PowerPoints, um, then uh, we're starting with the end of the models one. So let me screen share for y'all. There we go. It took me a bit of a second to refund there. All right, make sure the chat's open in case y'all have questions. Again, you can always unmute and ask questions too, just sometimes that's easier. All righty, get myself all set up here. All righty, so we ended off on Thursday uh, talking about sort of some of the models your book and I honestly don't go that much into because to be perfectly honest, they aren't used by that many people. Um, and those are the existential and the uh, humanistic models. Humanistic model, to be perfectly honest, is kind of the basis of good therapy, but not many people necessarily practice a purely humanistic uh, type of therapy anymore. So today we're going to be talking about the sociocultural model to start, and this is one that's used quite a bit. Um, so the idea here is that you can't look at a person in isolation. Uh, the sociocultural model says that we need to kind of, humans are social creatures, and so we need to kind of look at it as an overall perspective. So uh, we are going to start by talking mm -hmm. about family mm -hmm. therapy and family systems theory. Um, so the family in this case is seen as the unit, as the client, rather than the particular individuals within that therapeutic setting. So what you're treating as a family therapist and what we're examining from the point of view of this theory is the system of the family. And this could be an entire family or this could be just uh, a couple as well. Same principle applies. You're treating the relationship between the couple if you're doing couples therapy. And there's actually a specific degree you can get to do this type of therapy. You don't need this degree in particular, but if this is for sure what you want to do, you can get a master's called an MFT, marriage and family therapy. Um, Often there is an identified patient who is the one exhibiting symptoms, but in this theory, the idea is that the symptoms are representative of what's going on with the family as a whole. So uh, I'll use the example of eating disorders because family therapy was actually initially designed, uh, developed to treat anorexia nervosa. So the idea in that theory is that you have this identified patient, often a teenage girl who isn't eating, and what her eating disorder actually reflects is her feeling of lack of control in the family. Uh, often we talk about enmeshment, being like too involved in each other's lives, and so this is how she's trying to express independence. And so you can imagine other ways this would carry out. Uh, the example I always use is one that was given by 
my family therapy professor in grad school. Um, so he had a client come in, uh, parents and kiddo, and the kiddo was like acting out, always getting in trouble at school, that kind of thing. And in the middle of their intake, the parents started squabbling. And the little kid who was like eight turned to my professor who was his therapist and said, do you see why I always act up? The only time they agree is when they're both mad at me, <laughs> which is like a ton of insight to have as an eight-year-old, right? Um, so my professor said, you come sit by me to the kiddo uh, and just sort of said, I'm taking responsibility for their relationship and moved that to a couples therapy focus. Um, and it wasn't perfect, right? The kid, of course, reverted to old patterns every once in a while, but his behavior was almost immediately markedly better. So that's family systems theory. Um, and the idea is you are looking at this unit of the family. Couples therapy, as I mentioned, is used to help couples address long-term problems. As I mentioned, it's a traditionally called marriage therapy, but certainly any couple can do it. You don't have to be married. And in fact, uh, I've heard stories of like, um, you know, roommates or even like parent-child dyads. Uh, undergoing couple therapy uh, with a lot of help. Uh, and uh, for both family and couple therapy, you can go from a lot of different perspectives we've already talked about. Behavioral things are really common. So getting them to do exercises together. Uh, so one of the things you do in couple therapy is reflective listening. So you make one of them just listen while the other talks and then repeat back what the person talking said. This is really hard because typically when we are uh, listening <laughs> to another person, we're just thinking about what we're going to say back, right? Especially if we're mad at them. So this is a real challenge for them and a very good exercise. Our right, group therapy takes advantage of being able to learn from others and getting additional support. Um, so you can have very focused behaviorally based groups. We did this for people who were post bariatric surgery, who were struggling with maintaining the diet, maintaining the lifestyle changes, uh, or you can have sort of more open-ended groups. So um, one of the groups that I enjoyed but found very challenging while I was at the VA was a process group for women with PTSD. Um, and so I think at times we had like 25 women in that room, all of whom had different types of trauma. Um, you can also do self-help groups. So something like AA, uh, typically, unless you're doing it in a rehab setting, doesn't have a clinician there, uh, but serves a lot of the same purposes as a clinician-led group therapy. So culture and religion are other things that are important to keep in mind. So culture-sensitive therapies address unique issues for members of minority groups. Um, so a lot of uh, therapists that work with a lot of BIPOC people, uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color, if you're not familiar with that acronym, are really starting to do a lot of work around uh, racial trauma, um, which is sometimes also referred to as like inherited trauma, uh, you know, sort of everything that's been handed down from slavery, for example, that persists in all of the policies that we still have today. Um, and then religion. So Initially, therapists distanced themselves from it. Uh, Freud actually referred to religion as a defense mechanism. <laughs> um, but now we see the mental health benefits of faith. Uh, and you can incorporate it if your client is religious. You don't have to if your client is not. Some therapists, uh, particularly those trained by religious-focused schools, may choose to focus that way. So your regents, your liberties, um, and again, there's nothing wrong with that. It just means that some clients might not feel comfortable going to them if they don't share that faith. Community treatment encourages community care, letting clients, maybe with even severe mental illness, to receive treatment in familiar settings. And a big part of this is prevention. So efforts to improve community attitudes and policies or identify and treat disorders in early stages. So there have been uh, large-scale suicide prevention programs, uh, eating disorder prevention programs, things along those lines to try to essentially stop it before it starts. 
So I would say the vast majority of psychology now and how we do the science of psychology is actually rooted in the biopsychosocial model. And so it essentially integrates elements from all the models and recognizes the importance of not only your genes and your brain, not only your social interactions, not only your thoughts or your behaviors, but the interactions of all those things, right? Um, so for example, there is more and more evidence that expression of our genes, particularly as it relates to psychological issues, is very influenced by the environment. So uh, we're going to talk about sort of the diathesis stress in a second, and I'll explain that in more detail. So abnormality results from the interaction of genetic, biological, developmental, emotional, behavioral, cognitive, social, cultural, and societal influences, and probably more than that, right? <laughs> Everything interacts to create or abnormality or normality. So the diathesis stress model is the idea is that you have to carry a vulnerability or a diathesis to develop a disorder. And that may be biological, it could be a genetic, right? It could be a brain abnormality. Uh, it could be social, maybe you had a maladaptive upbringing. Or it could be psychological, like having destructive or maladaptive cognitions. Then a given stress trigger, which again can be biological, maybe you uh, contract a disease, uh, that's very stressful to cope with, it can be psychological, um, you experience a trauma, it can be social, uh, you know, you break up with a significant partner. Um, that happens and only when that stressor happens is the diathesis, is that vulnerability expressed? Does that disorder come out? So the way that my interpsych professor uh, Dr. McFarlane explained this to us when I was a freshman is uh, genes are expressed in an environment. And this sounds really weird if you're not used to thinking of it that way, uh, but the best example to wrap your head around, I think, is to think about something that seems as physically determined as height, right? So we think like you have a gene for height and that's going to be expressed no matter what. Well, what if you are nutritionally deprived, right? What if you just get totally inadequate nutrition growing up? Even though you're supposed to be six foot, you might end up being five eight, right? Because your genes can't fully express because they don't have what they need. The same thing can happen with psychological things. Maybe you're supposed to be the most intelligent person, the next Einstein, but you're raised in an environment where there are no books available, there are no educational toys available, maybe you're kept out of school, right? that's never going to fully develop because you don't have the environment for it. And the opposite, obviously, you could have all the genetic predispositions for depression. But if you never experience a life stressor, or you have adequate support in your life, you could never have a major depressive episode. That could happen. Reciprocal effects is essentially a more complex version of diathesis stress. It says that some key factors produce abnormal functioning by influencing other key factors. So the idea is rather than just being like, here's the diathesis, here's the stressor, that's what causes it, it's more sort of interwoven. And I would say the diathesis stress is the easiest way to understand it, but the reciprocal effects is probably, again, the most accurate, just recognizing the biopsychosocial model itself and how complex humans are. Okay, so this is a model. It's likely a different number in your current book. This is from several editions ago, but um, you don't have to memorize this table. It's just something that I find really helpful to compare them. Um, so certainly you can use this to kind of compare what's different about these. And I like that they're talking specifically about abnormality, right? All right, so if you remember, all last week when we were talking about the different model, we used an example case study, our patient S. And so I will reveal to you this patient now. 
it's Simba, it's my cat. Uh, so <laughs> he is four um, and he was like totally chill until we brought Quinn home. And then he like acted like a toddler uh, and he would like scratch the furniture even though he never did that to try to get our attention. Uh, you know, he's a cat. So he does have like these hyperactive tendencies. He does uh, bite and attack us, particularly me. I think he thinks I'm another cat. Like not Quinn or Brian, but me. Um, and so you, can, you might actually be able to see he got me pretty good over the weekend when he was just playing. Um, so this is our patient. Got a couple other cute pictures. So of course, today's the one day he's not anywhere near this room. Um, but he is my TA, as you can see. This is her me teaching. Uh, this top one here is me teaching last spring. This is me teaching last fall. Um, and then uh, this is actually, I did a study a couple of years back uh, that asked me to do yoga a couple of times a week. And he, as you can see, was really good at Shavasana. So, <laughs> all right. It's just goofy, something fun uh, to look at these things with a way that I don't have to like violate confidentiality of any client I've seen in the past. All right. So now we're going to start talking about research methods. And again, those of you who have taken other classes in the psych department, particularly classes with me, uh, a lot of this may end up feeling like review to you. And there's a reason we do that. Um, because psychology is a science and because honestly, part of what students struggle with the most is understanding research-based concepts. Uh, we purposely cover this in both sections of our intro class and in a lot of our 200 level courses as well. Um, to help you remember these things, but then also to specifically talk about what might be different about how we study and research within the particular subfields of psychology. So again, for those of you, especially that took personality with me last semester, a lot of this might look familiar. So without research, many of the statements that are on this next slide uh, would never have been refuted. So. I mentioned when we were talking about our history uh, that in ancient times, people believed the brain was kind of not important at all. The Egyptians would pull it out through the nose and just discard it. Uh, so Aristotle said, the brain is an organ of minor importance. Again, we've clearly refuted that now, right? But if no one ever did any research, if we all just took like the first thing someone ever said at face value, we might still believe that today, right? Uh, this one's great. <laughs> so Charles Duell, who works in the US Patent Office in 1899, so 120 years ago, um, said everything that has been, can be invented has been invented. Cool, so we would never have, you know, computers, iPhones, uh, you know, we would never have Alexa, right? Or uh, hybrid cars or electric cars. I think at that point we did have like a basic automobile, um, but certainly nothing like we have now, right? So again, if we had all taken him at face value and said, cool, we can stop inventing, right? <laughs> we wouldn't have all the technological advancements we have. Along those same lines, in 1977, Ken Olson of Digital Equipment Corporation said, there's no reason for any individual to have a computer in their home. So some context, when he was speaking, computers were bigger than the space I'm in. <laughs> Maybe probably like double the space I'm in. You can see pretty widely our loft office here. Um, and like that would be one computer, right? And you would have to like sign up for time on the computer and things along those lines. So yeah, that wasn't practical, right? But now not only do I have a computer here and my husband has a computer right over there, Right, but I carry a computer with more computing power than the spaceship that took the Apollo 11 astronauts to the moon, right? So like, again, these are short-sighted statements saying that, you know, oh, we're, we're good, right? And thank goodness people still do research and development because we have so many advances because of that. All right, so what is research? What is this? thing that we always talk about. So it's the systematic search for facts through the use of careful observations and investigations. So we tend to think of research as things they do in 
Greer, right? <laughs> the Greer Environmental Sciences Center, you know, test tubes and, and like maybe some like fish or rats, right? But research has a lot of different ways it can be done. Um, some research can be done just by sitting and observing either nature or people around you. Um, some research can be done by simply having people fill out questionnaires. Uh, other research requires more complex methodology. Um, so the idea is that only by rigorously testing theories or techniques like a type of therapy, for example, can we actually evaluate their accuracy and usefulness. Um, and you want to do that on a representative group of subjects they're sometimes called. In the modern era, we tend to call uh, people who are part of research studies participants more um, because it implies active involvement rather than just passively we're doing research to you. And most research we do, the participants are very actively involved, including research with animals, although we do call them subjects. So, um, this is really hard <laughs> in abnormal psychology uh, and clinical psychology because as we've already mentioned people are pretty complex if you think about what we just talked about right with the biopsychosocial theory that's a lot right um at the same token we want to be able to examine these things right so we have to come up with clever methods for trying to do so like i've joked with other classes I have in the past that like, if I could just take when we're in person, obviously, um, you know, some sort of like UPC scanner and like scan your ear and know how much you picked up for my lectures, I would never have to give you an exam, right? But because I don't have that and like, I don't know that I would want to, right? Because it's a little like minority report after some point, um, then we come up with more creative methods to try to assess what you're learning. So uh, this is especially tricky if you're trying to test treatments, right? So, uh, you know, how do you test a treatment and what do you compare it to? That can get really tricky. We'll talk about that as we talk about the different terms of blind designs. And um, treatments themselves can be quite complex and we're in doing things with people's mental well-being, right? So if we know this is working, why on earth would we not give it to everybody, right? Why would we have a comparison group? Um, so that gets tricky as well. Some other challenges for clinical researchers include measuring unconscious motives. So there may be motives the client has, the participant has that they don't even recognize themselves, right? Um, and so then how are we supposed to get at that? Uh, assessing private thoughts. So it may be they are aware of what they're thinking, but they don't want to share that with us because they're embarrassed, right? Um, and then doing things like monitoring mood changes, right? So when do you go from feeling meh to just okay to like maybe a little bit happy, right? We don't have precise measurements of that. So as I've mentioned, and as we really try to emphasize within our major here, um, psychology is based on the scientific method. So uh, researchers must use the scientific method in order to adequately make sure they're doing these studies, this research correctly. Um, and so it involves systematically gathering and evaluating information. So systematically gathering and evaluating information. And you do that through careful observation to gain an understanding of whatever you're trying to study. Could be a disorder, could be a type of therapy, could be a personality trait, right? So I'll say that whole definition again. So the scientific method involves systematically gathering and evaluating information through careful observation to gain an understanding of whatever you're studying, the construct, the phenomenon, whatever word you want to use there. 
And again, observation can be a whole host of things, so even within psychology. So observation may involve uh, having people do a cheek swab to test their cortisol levels to get an approximation of how stressed out they are. It can be having someone fill out a questionnaire. It can be behavioral observation behind a one-way mirror, right? There are lots of different ways we can observe folks. So science itself is the pursuit of systematized knowledge through observation. So that observation becomes important. So the objections of uh, objectives, sorry, of the science are uh, description. So this is really the initial uh, work that a lot of psychologists and psychiatrists did was just trying to describe the abnormality that they saw, doing things like giving a name to the disorder. Prediction of what the outcome will be. So if we do therapy, will this person get better? We sure hope so, right? Um, but we do need to test that. We can't just assume that will be the case. We try to control anything that we can control. Um, and maybe sometimes we're trying to control the outcome, trying to you know help that person control their own urges, for example. And then understanding. We're trying to come to an understanding of disorders, we're trying to come to an understanding of why they occur uh, and then what can be done. And the understanding that we tend to look at is the nomothetic understanding. And nomo here just means name. Uh, and nomothetic is like an overall understanding of, you know, let's again use a, a disorder as an example. So if we're doing research, we're trying to get a nomothetic understanding of this disorder, this concept we're looking at. We're not focusing in on an individual. We're doing sort of this abstract, bigger picture. Now, when we talk about assessment, um, starting maybe this week, probably, yeah, we'll start it on Thursday. Um, then we're looking for what we call an ideographic understanding. And so an ideographic understanding, nice way to remember this is I ideographic, I individual, um, is looking at that individual person who's in front of you, right? Understanding what disorder they have, understanding how to help them. So nomothetic is what we do in research. It is looking at the concepts, it's looking at the disorders as a whole. Ideographic is what we do in assessment and therapy. Oh, now you come, hello. Um, <laughs> And it is uh, focusing on that individual and how to help that person in front of you. And both of these are really necessary because the research through that nomothetic understanding helps inform what we do ideographically. And so I typically write this on the board, but since I don't have a board, I'm gonna walk you really quickly uh, through the scientific method. Um, so when we are doing science, the first thing we start with is a theory. Okay, so imagine me just writing these in a vertical line on the board with arrows in between each. Um, and so the theory is what we've already talked about. It's the models. It is, you know, what is our idea of how to explain what's going on? And theories can be really broad, like Freud's psychoanalytic theory, or theories can be pretty narrow. Like there's a theory I use in a lot of my research called objectification theory that looks really just at risk factors for disordered eating. Um, so you start with that, and based on the theory that exists, you come up with a hypothesis. So for your specific research study, which part of that are you going to look at? So for example, my master's thesis study, I looked at how do these factors related to body image all interact to predict it. Um, so I looked at things like self-objectification and pressures from the media, pressures from your family, things like that. And then after the hypothesis, you're gonna collect some data. And again, this is gonna vary depending on the design of your study. Um, so it might be that, and, and the kind of going with the data is the method here, the method or design of your study. Um, Again, it might be that you are doing 
biological sampling. So I was a control sam subject, I think I mentioned to the, this last week, in a DNA gene study about anorexia, right? It can be, it can look like biology or chemistry. It can also be giving people questionnaires or having them come into the lab and manipulating something. Or um, a lot of recent research, including my dissertation study, focuses on what's called uh, ecological momentary assessment, where you have the person, uh, now they do it on an app, back in, <laughs> back in my day, <laughs> we did it on Palm Pilots, Ooh, I feel old, um, and you actually record stuff throughout your day, which is kind of cool. So you get, you design whatever you're going to do, you get data from that. And then there's a couple things that can happen. If you found you supported your hypothesis, awesome. <laughs> then what you're going to do is uh, present it in some way. Or the fancy word we're using these days in psychology is uh, dissemination, which just means get it out there. Um, so you could write a article for a journal. You could present it at a conference. I do a lot of conference presentations of my work. Um, you could write a popular press book about this. Several psychologists have done that over time. Um, you could uh, talk to the media about it. Um, and I've done that when some of my studies come out. Um, but this doesn't always happen. <laughs> Sometimes you get here and you didn't find it all what you wanted. Sometimes that's interesting enough results to still report it, but sometimes you need to look at why. Like, did you maybe design things incorrectly and you thought you were measuring something, but you really weren't? Could it be that maybe your hypothesis was off somehow and didn't really, wasn't really based in theory? If you've gone and tweaked those things quite a bit and you're still not finding it, it maybe you need to go back and tweak the theory. Maybe the theory is wrong, right? That can happen. Again, for some reason, Einstein's on my brain today, right? When he developed his theory of gravity, everyone was just on Newtonian physics, right? Like the apple's gonna fall on your head, boom. Uh, and Einstein showed it's much more complex than that. And modern science, which they didn't have available at his time, is still providing data that supports this. So uh, within the past five years, they found evidence of gravitational waves, uh, which is something Einstein hypothesized again decades ago. So that is the basic order. Uh, and you, again, just repeat ad nauseum. <laughs> so if you are uh, a peer researcher, or if you're a professor who does research as part of your load, like I do, uh, you do a lot of this in your life. All right, so now we're going to start talking about the different types of uh, like, overall studies, we're not going to drill down into exact techniques. Um, but the types of overall studies we do to examine these things, and pardon me just a sec here. <laughs> I'm due for my allergy shots tomorrow, and I can always tell <laughs> the day before. Um, so one is the case study. And so a case study provides a detailed description uh, that interprets information you get of a person's life, and in this case, their psychological problems, right? If we're talking about abnormality. And so you have one person described in great detail, and then you interpret what you describe. Again, from the point of view of whatever your theory is, right? So a behaviorist will probably describe something very differently than a humanist than would a psychoanalyst, right? So uh, it can serve as a source of new ideas about behavior. Uh, so Freud's theories were almost entirely based on case studies. And it was good in, and it's good inspiration from research. It may offer a tentative support for a theory with one patient. It can challenge a theory's assumptions. It can even inspire new therapeutic techniques. The other thing that case studies do is they allow us to study unusual problems. So for example, one of the things we'll talk about later in the semester is dissociative identity disorder. What used to be called multiple personality disorder. And this disorder is very, very rare. You know, in, I had three out of maybe my, you know, 20 professors I had throughout grad school and residency um, who had said they had seen one case of DID in their entire career. 
you know, these are 20 plus year careers. Um, so that just shows you how rare it is, right? So you're not gonna get a sample of 100 people with DID. Sometimes all you can do is a case study in that case. With modern techniques, they may be able to actually, like recruiting online and things like that. But certainly prior to that, not really. Um, a common example that I bring up is the case of Little Hans. And Little Hans was a Freud case study. Uh, he was one of the few kids that Freud himself saw. Uh, Freud tended to work with young adults to adults. Um, and so uh, for, uh, Little Hans had a fear of horses, which is why we have this lovely depiction of a horse here. Um, and Freud decided that Little Hans's fear of horses was linked to that Oedipal complex we talked about last week. Um, that somehow this horse was representative of the phallus and he had castration anxiety and that's what was going on. And Freud told the fact that Little Hans had once seen a horse fall in the street right next to him and was terrified as completely insignificant, right? So again, here we can see different theories interpreting things different ways. Another example is, again, when we first describe a disease. And so in this case, we're going to talk about Alzheimer's disease. So Alois Alzheimer, uh, near the early 1900s, he described a patient exhibiting symptoms of forgetfulness, disorientation, and a general decline in level of functioning. The patient he described was later referred to as having Alzheimer's disease after his name because he was the first to give a detailed descriptive account of the disease. And this happens quite a bit in medicine. Um, so if you think about things like Parkinson's or Huntington's, those are named for the people who first described them as well. So again, case studies can be a really good jumping off point. There are some limitations to the case study technique, including bias on the part of the observer. Um, so as we just talked about, your theoretical orientation is gonna bias you, even if you don't mean it to. Uh, the example I always give, there's a couple examples. <laughs> uh, one is that when I was seeing clients because my background is in disordered eating, I would always ask about if they had any issues with their eating. And even if they didn't meet criteria for an eating disorder, it was always interesting to me to see if they had something like stress eating. And that was something that we could work on behaviorally. Whereas someone who didn't have my training probably wouldn't even ask about that. The weirder example I can get is when I was at my placement, when I was in grad school, um, there was a psychiatry clinic across the hall and they referred a lot of their patients to us for therapy. They would do med management. And I got, a, I had actually several clients from this one psychiatrist and this psychiatrist did not believe that depression was a thing. He thought anyone with depression was just bipolar and just hadn't had a manic episode yet. So he would, in my opinion, incorrectly diagnose them as having bipolar disorder, even if they'd never shown any signs of mania. Um, and so again, there's some weird bias, right? That can come into play. And as I mentioned, it can be on the part of the reporter. Sometimes people can't give full descriptions of what's going on because they don't have the words. Um, in the case of little Hans, little Hans's father was a great fan of Freud. He'd actually read Freud's work. Um, so he tended to report information that supported Freud's theory and ignore or de-emphasize information that did not. And that can happen even if you're not a famous therapist, simply because of that therapeutic relationship, right? That sometimes clients can be afraid of disappointing their therapist, want to present the best way possible. And so um, this is something I actually, a lot of eating disorder clients are perfectionistic. So I'd have to work with them on like, it's okay not to be the perfect client, right? Case studies also rely on subjective evidence rather than objective things that can be directly observed. So this means they're low on internal validity. Internal validity is the accuracy with which a study can rule out all possible causes except one, right? You just, you really can't do that with a case study because you're just looking at all the stuff going on with this one person. Case studies are also hard to generalize. You don't want to take one person's experience and say that that applies to everyone, right? That would be 
really scientifically irresponsible. Um, although they describe a specific individual in great detail, the information is often relevant only to that person being described. And it doesn't generalize to all people with the disorder. And this means case studies also have low external validity. Um, and essentially, external validity is a scientific way to say generalizability. So basically, having a low external validity means that they have a low degree to which this study results can be generalized beyond that person. And it's not just case studies. Other studies can have low external validity, be hard to generalize. In fact, unfortunately, a lot of studies in psychology end up having this because we tend to use convenient samples of folks like yourselves, college students for course credit, extra credit, right? Um, and so Wesleyan's actually very fortunate in that we have a fairly diverse student body, which is fantastic. I believe we have uh, 40 percent uh, individuals of color. Where I went to college in the middle of Ohio, we had, I think, 7 percent, right? And unfortunately, that's fairly typical of a lot of places of higher learning. So we get all this research based on samples that are essentially upper middle class to upper class white folks, right? And so that can really limit your generalizability. And good psychologists recognize this. Um, some don't, which is really unfortunate. All right, the correlational method is more rigorous than the uh, case study. And so we're going to talk next after this about experiments. And a lot of people argue that experiments are the gold standard in psychology. More and more, we're also acknowledging that well-constructed correlational studies are actually just as good. And in fact, can sometimes answer questions experiments can't. Um, so I'm just putting that out there because a lot of things you read will be like, experiments are the only way to go, but we can miss a lot of information from them that we can garner from correlational studies. All right, so correlation is essentially the degree to which two characteristics, events vary with each other. So it's the relationship between or among at least two variables. Often in psychology, we're looking at much more complex models with a whole bunch of variables and how they relate to each other. And that's all part of the correlational method. So it measures the strength of that relationship. And the variables are assessed as they exist in nature. There's no experimental manipulation. Um, so again, we're either directly observing that person, we're having them fill out questionnaires, uh, we're not doing anything to manipulate how they respond. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not any <laughs> uh, influence on them. So one of the things I like to mention is actually a physics principle called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And that essentially says it's a really boiling, doubling down, paraphrasing, but you can't study something without changing it, right? So if someone knows that you as a psychologist are having to fill out this questionnaire, right, they're going to kind of wonder why and try to guess, and that might influence their answers. But as much as possible, we try to just study things as they exist in correlational studies. So a good example of a correlational study would be having someone fill out a questionnaire about stress and one about depression. In this case, you're not making the subject stressed, which we can do with experimental manipulations where we have them do uh, tasks that you can never actually solve. Uh, we're not trying to make them depressed, right? We're not playing sad music or sad movies. We're just seeing how depressed they are, how stressed they are. The most important thing in my notes, I say perhaps one of the most important things. Now, the most important thing to know about correlation is that it does not imply causation. Okay, correlation does not imply causation. And what I mean by that is that if you know a correlation exists, you can't say one of the things caused the other one. This is a big mistake the media often makes when they're reporting on stories. So they'll, and this happens in medicine even too, 
there will be large scale correlational studies and then the news will get a hold of it and they'll be like, did you know eating chocolate can cure cancer? And it was just like people who ate more chocolate happen to have fewer symptoms, right? That doesn't mean one thing caused the other, right? It could be that when you have cancer, you just don't feel like eating chocolate because of the chemo. And that's uh, where our depression and stress model can come in again as a nice example. So uh, if you have a high level of stress and also a high level of depression, you can't conclude that you're depressed because you're stressed, right? It could be that. It could be that you're stressed out and that's making you feel depressed. But it could also be that because you're depressed and the symptoms of depression include like not being able to get out of bed, having a hard time getting things done, that's stressing you out because you're not getting stuff done, right? Or it could be that there's a third thing going on. Like we're in the middle of a global pandemic that makes a lot of us feel stressed and depressed, right? Um, and so you need to take that into account as well. And so just because you find a correlation doesn't mean you can say, oh, A caused B. It's also important to consider the magnitude of the correlation. And we measure this with a statistic. Uh, typically it is the Pearson's R. Um, and correlations can range from negative one to positive one. Um, and so zero is no correlation. Zero is the weakest correlation. So if you have a correlation of zero or close to zero, it basically says these things aren't related. One and negative one are equally strong. And this is something people often have a hard time wrapping their heads around. But it's just the, the, the numerical sign or uh, you know, whether it's negative or positive just tells you the direction of the relationship. And it's just how far they are from zero as to how strong it is. So the closer a correlation is to either positive or negative one, the stronger it is. And again, positive one and negative one are equally strong. And again, here's something I think is helpful to have a diagram. So here is a positive correlation. A positive correlation is when as one thing goes up, so does the other. So this is our stress and depression uh, example. So here you see people who score higher on a stress scale are also scoring higher on a depression scale. And as we just talked about, that doesn't mean one of them causes the other. Uh, oftentimes the language we use if we were describing this in a presentation or an article would be they vary together or they're related. So that's a positive correlation. Then there's a negative correlation. And so a negative correlation is as one score goes up, the other one goes down. So uh, the example here that they're using, they're using depression again, and then they're using activity level. And so here you see that the higher you score on depression, the lower your scores on activity level and vice versa, the more active you are, the less depressed you are. And again, we can't say one causes the other um, because it could be that because you're depressed, we know one of the symptoms of depression is you engage in fewer activities. It could be you can't uh, participate in activities and that's making you stress or depressed, again, like during the pandemic. <laughs> or it could be a third thing, maybe you broke your leg, right? And so you're depressed because of that, but also your activity level has to go down <laughs> because you can't be as active as you were. One thing I wanted to point out too, is if we look at this negative correlation table and then go back to the positive one, if I held up a mirror in between them, they would be a perfect reflection, right? And so these are two equally strong correlations just in different directions. Now, no correlation, a correlation of zero um, is this. It's, you can see there's no relationship. There's no real line here. Um, and the example they're giving here is depression and IQ. We know these are not related. You can be really smart or struggle in the IQ area and be depressed. And you can be uh, super depressed and be super smart or not so smart, right? They don't relate to each other. Uh, 
So these are, again, no correlation. It would be a correlation of zero were you to run this statistic. <clears throat> There are several ways we can take that correlational method and make it uh, do more work for us, right? Not just looking at one or a few variables together, but expanding it. Um, so for example, epidemiological studies, look at the incidence and prevalence of disorders in populations. So um, they are looking at incidence. Incidence is the number of new cases in a population during a given time. So like the incidence of COVID yesterday would be the number of new cases, wherever you're looking, say Virginia. And then prevalence is the total number of cases in the population at any given time. So, you know, like right now, how many people have COVID regardless of when they contracted it. And we can obviously do this for psychological disorders as well. So the uh, graph down in the corner here actually shows the prevalence of depression uh, in certain age groups. And also the red bar represents female, the blue bar represents male. And so you can see that it tends to spike, particularly for females in the 18 to 24 range. Um, and there's a lot of research to back that up. When we get to depression, we'll talk about some of the reasons why that is. And this can be really informative. Um, and then longitudinal studies involve observing the same subjects on many occasions over longer periods of time. So you're essentially doing correlational studies, but so you do it now and then you do it in a year and then you do it the year after that. So you're gathering the same information uh, on the same people at different time points. And that allows you to compare across different time points, right? So then even though you can't still say this caused that, you can still start to see like, okay, so we're seeing a correlation that people that were sort of high on stress at time one are higher on depression at time two, right? And then that confounds even more at time three. So, you know, it's looking at sort of what is the pattern of things over time and you can get more at risk factors that way. All right, as so then we have the experimental method. And this, the experiment allows for determination of a causal relationship between two variables. And that's because you as the experimenter are manipulating at least one of the variables. So, the experiment involves random assignment. So you come up with experimental conditions. That's what you're manipulating is, you know, this one variable that's going to create these conditions. And anyone who comes into your study is equally likely to end up in either of those groups. Uh, and there's a bunch of ways you can do this. Uh, old school is you just flip a coin or like pull a group out of a hat. New school is there is uh, there exist random number generators um, online and you can just use those. In fact, that's how I do my randomization, not only for my studies, but also actually for like multiple choice questions on tests. <laughs> um, so you have an independent variable that you're manipulating. So you believe that that is the causal variable, that by manipulating that variable, that independent variable, you're going to cause a change in the dependent variable. And this is the, also referred to as the DV, and it's assumed to be controlled by that IV in some way, or at least influenced by it. So, you know, maybe if we wanted to get more into our stress and depression, uh, one, we would try to stress people out in the lab, again, maybe by giving them one of these impossible to solve tasks, and then see if that affects their depression level or their mood in the moment. So statistics and research design are important in really any study, but become even more important in experiments. Uh, so researchers must try to eliminate all confounds, which are also called nuisance variables. So these are variables other than the independent variable that could affect the dependent variable. Um, so example here, uh, I have a friend who 
uh, it was trying to do a study on attention in a couple different sites. And one of the sites had construction outside the window. So uh, they, once they figured that out, they had to throw out the data, right, for those people because they had a confound that was going to influence their uh, ability to focus that wasn't at the other sites. Compounds can also be things like, again, being in the middle of a global pandemic. Like if you had started to collect data on a stress-based study in January last year, and then tried to just keep going with it, right? And like not account for the fact that people are in isolation and people are losing their jobs, right? You would get some really weird results. So um, sometimes there are things we totally can't control, but we try to control as many as we can. So similar environment, you know, making sure we're doing these at a similar time of day, uh, using the same instructions for every participant who comes in, uh, that type of thing. So three features are included in experiments to guard against compounds. Um, the first is having a control group and experimental. Group. And this is what I sort of alluded to on the previous slide. So the control group is a group of participants who are not exposed to whatever way we're manipulating that variable, that IV, that independent variable. But everything else they're doing is similar to that of the experimental group. So maybe they come in and they don't get that stressful task. They instead uh, you know, do a task that's solvable um, or they just do something else during that time. And then by the, comparing the outcome of each group, the control and the experimental groups, then we can better determine the effect of the independent variable. If we just did something where we looked at the experimental group, we could say, oh, we're finding something, but we can't conclude it's because we manipulated the independent variable unless we have a comparison. Random assignment, again, I alluded to, uh, means that every participant in the experiment is as likely to be placed in one group as the other. So we're not going to like be like, ooh, I want the smarter people to be in my experimental group, right? No, we're gonna randomly assign them. And we're hoping to sort of equal out, balance out all those things like, you know, gender, race, things along those lines. Um, and blind design. So blind design becomes especially important if we are looking at uh, therapy studies, medication studies, things along those lines. So um, a blind design is built around placebo therapy. And placebo therapy is the idea of substituting an imitation, something that looks or tastes like real therapy, but is not. And again, this is easier to imagine for a medication. So I'm gonna use that example initially. So let's say you came up with a great new drug that you think is going to just make depression go away, right? So you would give that to your experimental group and then your control group would get a placebo and the placebo would essentially be a sugar pill made to look the same color, the same size, everything as the actual medication, right? And then you're saying, is it just taking the pill that makes people feel better or is it actually taking my medication, which hopefully has the active ingredients that are helping them? This whole idea of blind design and placebo therapy is designed to get rid of experimenter bias. And experimenter bias is also sometimes called the Rosenthal effects, um, where experimenters may have expectations that they unintentionally transmit to their participants. So I can say the same thing to you, but in totally different ways, right? I can be like, here's this drug. I think if you take it, it's really gonna help your depression. Or I can be like, Here's this drug. I think if you take it, it really want to help your depression, right? <laughs> See, and again, it doesn't have to be that obvious. It can be more subtle things, uh, tone of voice, things along those lines. I'm going to sit because I'm going to show a video in a sec here. Oops. Bop backwards. There we go. So um, we want to avoid that. We want to avoid the Rosenthal effect. We want to try to be 
as unbiased as possible. There we go. Um, so how do we do that? Well, we can do that using what are called blind designs. And we can blind in many different levels. Um, so the simplest one is the single blind design. In the single blind design, the person getting the medication doesn't know that they're getting a placebo or maybe not. Um, so this could be, you know, just the participant. A double blind design, neither the participant nor the research assistant was giving out the drug notes. So the research assistant, you know, perhaps in this case, a nurse would come in uh, that day and there would be two bottles marked A and B. They wouldn't know which is which. And remember, with placebo therapy, they're designed to look exactly the same. Um, and then they would just be told, you're giving prescription A out today. And then um, they can't influence the person because they don't know which one it is. Now, someone in the background, usually the principal investigator, would know which is which, right, is keeping track uh, for the sake of the study. But um, that's a nice way to try to reduce that birth and fall effect. Triple blind design, it goes really important in psychological studies where you need to observe behaviors uh, to see how things are working. And so, you know, sometimes you observe them in person, sometimes it might be a video of the person, sometimes it might be again behind one of those one-way mirrors. And uh, um, in that case, the person who's rating the behavior uh, would also be blind. And again, still there would be this principal investigator who knew and could put everything together. Um, but this again, gets the bias out of how they're going to rate that person, uh, which I think is also important. So I have a quick video here that I'm going to uh, show you all about the placebo effect. So let me go ahead and pull my Zoom controls so that I can do a new share. I used to have a great video from Penn and Teller's bullshit for this, um, but it's been pulled, so. In 1996, 56 volunteers took part in a study to test a new painkiller called Trivaricane. On each subject, one index finger was covered in the new painkiller, while the other remained untouched. Then, both were squeezed in painful clamps. The subjects reported that the treated finger hurt less than the untreated one. This shouldn't be surprising, except Trivaricane wasn't actually a painkiller just a fake concoction with no pain easing properties at all. What made the students so sure this dummy drug had worked? The answer lies in the placebo effect, an unexplained phenomenon wherein drugs, treatments, and therapies that aren't supposed to have an effect and are often fake, miraculously make people feel better. Doctors have used the term placebo since the 1700s, when they realized the power of fake drugs to improve people's symptoms. These were administered when proper drugs weren't available, or if someone imagined they were ill. In fact, the word placebo means I shall please in Latin, hinting at a history of placating troubled patients. Placebos had to mimic the real treatments in order to be convincing, so they took the form of sugar pills, water-filled injections, and even sham surgeries. Soon, doctors realized that duping people in this way had another use, in clinical trials. By the 1950s, researchers were using placebos as a standard tool to test new treatments. To evaluate a new drug, for instance, half the patients in a trial might receive the real pill. The other half would get a placebo that looked the same. Since patients wouldn't know whether they'd receive the real thing or a dud, the results wouldn't be biased, researchers believed. Then, if the new drug showed a significant benefit compared to the placebo, it was proved effective. Nowadays, it's less common to use placebos this way because of ethical concerns. If it's possible to compare a new drug against an older version or another existing drug, that's preferable to simply giving someone no treatment at all, especially if they have a serious ailment. In these cases, placebos are often used as a control to fine-tune the trial, 
so that the effects of the new versus the old or alternative drug can be precisely compared. But of course, we know the placebos exert their own influence too. Thanks to the placebo effect, patients have experienced relief from a range of ailments, including heart problems, asthma, and severe pain. Even though all they'd received was a fake drug or sham surgery, we're still trying to understand how. Some believe that instead of being real, the placebo effect is merely confused with other factors, like patients trying to please doctors by falsely reporting improvements. On the other hand, researchers think that if a person believes a fake treatment is real, their expectations of recovery actually do trigger physiological factors that improve their symptoms. Placebos seem to be capable of causing measurable change in blood pressure, heart rate, and the release of pain-reducing chemicals like endorphins. That explains why subjects in pain studies often say placebos ease their discomfort. Placebos may even reduce levels of stress hormones like adrenaline, which can slow the harmful effects of an ailment. So shouldn't we celebrate the placebo's bizarre benefits? Not necessarily. If somebody believes a fake treatment has cured them, they may miss out on drugs or therapies that are proven to work. Plus, the positive effects may fade over time, and often do. Placebos also cloud clinical results, making scientists even more motivated to discover how they wield such power over us. Despite everything we know about the human body, there are still some strange and enduring mysteries, like the placebo effect. So what other undiscovered marvels might we contain? It's easy to investigate the world I'm going to end that there, stop us there. Um, so one of the things with the placebo effect is how do you do that with therapy, right? Like that's what becomes tricky when you're designing therapy studies. Um, and so you might be able to compare to um, treatment as usual. So like if you're trying to add a technique uh, and see what effect that has, you could compare it to sort of the normal way of doing that treatment and the experimental group would only get that technique. Um, you could compare to like just sitting and talking to the person, but we know that that's essentially, as we mentioned before, humanistic therapy, right? And does work in some way. Uh, a lot of times what we do in, for a placebo in therapy studies is actually just putting people on a wait list uh, because there's research to show that just being given hope that you will get treatment essentially creates a placebo effect in people where they actually start feeling that and so then it's can the therapy improve their mood over and above that but obviously it's not perfect um and obviously it, it's tricky to do that and to, and to do it well and so uh psychologists particularly clinical psychologists are always striving to find ways to do these types of clinical trials well and find a therapy placebo right or compare it to something else so I'm going to end there for today, and then we'll pick up with this one on Thursday, and then we'll start talking about the more ideographic stuff with uh, assessment, diagnosis, and treatment. Um, and so I'll stick around a couple of minutes in case you have questions, but otherwise, have a good day, and I will see you on Thursday. I have a quick question. Sure. Um, about the placebo effect. So when they utilize patients for the experiments, because, you know, you know, if you got a terminal illness, I'm sure this is something that's something you would want to play with. So how do they kind of utilize or pick who they want to utilize for the experiments? Do they say, OK, we can't find a reason for why you're in pain. So let's try Maybe let's try this person. How do they do that? Yeah, it really depends on what drug they're trying to test, how they're going to go about doing that. So, you know, if they're trying to test a pain med, right? Yeah, your participants you would recruit would be people with chronic pain in those cases. Uh, you know, if you're trying to test a medication that's supposed to help people with like really stubborn depression, right, then that's the group you're going to recruit. Uh, but yeah, like the ethics of this do get sketchy, right? So like if you have someone who has a potentially fatal illness and you have, um, you know, uh, you're comparing a placebo to it, you know, like how can you ethically not give that person the treatment for a long period of time, which is why, again, most psychological ones, you're just on a wait list. And then, you know, like eight weeks later, you get the treatment. Um, but yeah, right. it, it, I remember hearing about a study recently, I think it was related to COVID, where they started to do a placebo-based study, and then they just realized that it was so much better that they stopped and they just switched everybody to the medication. 
for that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. You're welcome. It. Great question. Have a good one. You too.